Welcome to New England Lacrosse Journal's Chasing the Gold podcast, your destination for all things lacrosse. I'm your host, Kyle Devitt, and uh, he's not alongside me, but he is my co-host, Mr. Jack Piatelli. How are we doing, Jack? Doing well. Unlike you, unfortunately, I uh, heard you had a little injury. What's going on? Men's it's, league? It's not little. Uh, oh. It's a full-blown ACL rupture, uh, so I can't drive. Uh, I'm currently in my apartment, hence the background with my many retired sticks in the background. Um, yeah, it was men's league. I just cut hard to the right, tried to turn left. Knee gave out. Um, got an MRI. It's been about a month. And surgery is set for September 6th. So I will be out from NELJ as well for you know a couple weeks, if not a month, uh, trying to recover from that. Never had an injury this bad, uh, but you know we're gonna get through it. It's it's fine, you know. Well, I, I'm tough, right? I'm confident right? I'll see you back on the field again. Dominant. Yeah, that's. I they actually tried to give me the old man graft, and I was like, no, dude, I'm going back. Good and to they're you. Like you're a little. I'm like I bring the other guy in here. <laughs> I'm like bring the other surgeon in here. Um, do the one that makes me play. And he goes, <laughs> okay, that's gonna hurt. I'm like, I know. Just do it. So we're going to do that. And, um, you know, it'll be like a year. So going to be gimping around for a year, but that's fine. That's part of being human. Um, but, you know, speaking of bringing back the podcast, we got a new guest who has a new job, who, I, who you and I knew in several other incarnations as a player and a coach working with club teams. And that's uh, new Harvard coach, Christian Thomas. Christian, welcome to the podcast, man. Thanks. Excited to be here. We're uh, we're gonna knock off some rust, man. I'm not gonna lie to you. We haven't done this for a while. We're uh, this is our first podcast after our summer break, somewhat imposed from my injury, somewhat from us basically just having insane schedules all summer, which I'm sure that you know very well uh, from your background with with club teams and um, now with Harvard. Uh, when did you join the staff at Harvard? Uh, it was about a couple of weeks ago. Um, summer was winding down with tournaments and whatnot. And uh, I reached out over there um, for uh, the assistant gig that was open. And um, then Coach Byrne reached back out to me and mentioned the director of ops gig and said, uh, you know, he'd be happy to talk more about it. And I was like, yeah, I'd definitely love to talk more about it. And, um, you know, end up having a conversation and uh, met up with him. And, you know, from there, uh, we had a great talk. and. You no, know, it was a great opportunity for me, so I definitely wanted to uh, pursue it. You know that your, your uh, life's going to be yeah. I know. <laughs> so, uh, right. You know your life's going to be tough playing for working with GB, right? Uh, I'm excited for it. He uh, it, he's great to me so far. It's challenging, man. Like I I worked for him for one season, and I was like, that was the best and the worst at the same time. And he knows this. I've said this to his face, and we're not talking any shade at all. He he knows this is how I feel. But he, you'll learn so much in such a short amount of time. And he is such a great mentor, uh, just in general, of everybody that works for him. So it'll be it'll be challenging, but I think you'll like it. That's awesome. I worked for Jerry Byrne, too. He was my national sales right. manager right. at Brine. And he used to come out of his office, and his, there was steam coming out of his head, and his face was all red. And he, like everybody ran away. Oh, here comes Jerry. He's coming out of the office. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Things haven't changed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I know. So, Christian, we you grew up in a them. hockey family, and look at you yeah. today. You're at the, going to Harvard. It's uh, pretty exciting um, having the opportunity to coach at Harvard. What does it mean to you? It's awesome. Um, you know, part of the reason why I've wanted to get into the coaching world is that I grew up, my dad coached at Babson Hockey um, for the early years of my life. Uh, I remember going to the rinks and going to the locker room, me and my brother, you know, they used to put us in the middle of the logo and have us fight. Um, you know, so that was a huge part of my growing up. Uh, and then from there, you know, I've had some great coaches along the way, one being uh, Coach Piatelli over here. And, um, you know, so I think in the back of my head, I always had the idea that I wanted to be um, some sort of coach mentor in whatever way I could with some with some of these players. Um, and then as, as I got older, just the passion grew a little bit more for me. Um, you know, so I was, I was lucky enough to come out of Merrimack and coach Morgan gave me a gig over there right away. And, um, I learned a lot from them and it was awesome. And, you know, I, I realized that I, I really did love it. So, 
I was looking to, uh, you know, keep, keep moving up in, in the world and hopefully, um, you know, get another spot. And luckily I, I landed one over at Harvard for now. And, um, yeah, it's pretty crazy how it all happened. Um, you know, I was just lucky enough to, to fall in some, some good people's hands and they gave me some opportunities. So what was it like for you to coach players that you played with last year at Merrimack? Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, there was one kid that I actually coached that was in my grade prior, uh, Carlin Joyle. He was, uh, he was a sixth year. So that, that was an interesting step, um, to get going. Uh, first couple of practices were definitely interesting, not having the pads on with them. You know, we used to obviously go at it for a while and now I'm on the other side of it. Uh, so, you know, there was, there was a couple, uh, ball busting back and forth, uh, here and there, but once, you know, you get into the thick of it, you know, we're all so competitive that, we all just wanted to win. So, you know, whoever had an idea and whatnot, we're bouncing around off each other and ended up becoming pretty natural towards the end of it. Um, but for sure, at first it was, uh, it was very interesting, especially with the older guys I've been with for four or so years. Were you surprised at how much time coach Morgan put in off the field now that you're part of his staff? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, that was like one thing when I came in, I didn't really know what to expect with all that stuff. You know, I, felt like I had a pretty good idea of what, uh, excuse me, went on on the field because I was part of it as a player as well. But the off the field stuff, it was wild to, to see like all the time that they put into recruiting, um, you know, alumni relations, like all those types of things that, um, you know, I learned in that, that one year over there with them um, in the offices is so important. And, and that stuff all correlates onto the field, um, you know, getting all that stuff buttoned up, making sure that, you know, you're, you're game planning and bouncing ideas back and forth off each other and, you know, trying to find what is the best fit for, for the team and for the coaching staff. Um, you know, that was a very eye opening experience for me. And, and, you know, I'm glad that I did that year over there with them because, you know, I, I learned so much, um, that I would not have known if I just tried to go out and go like right away out into the, the coaching world. What's the one thing you learned that you're going to take with you to Harvard? at Merrimack? Um, one thing that, that I love um, that Coach Morgan has put in uh, as a player and as coach is uh, all the little details of everything and making sure that, you know, like everything that you're doing means something, no matter if it's, you know, ordering equipment or um, getting that extra dollar from alumni on donations or going to that extra tournament uh, to see that kid that you might not have seen, like all those small uh, things that, you know, could, you could just skip it and not do it. Um, if you really focus on just like that part, then the big picture starts to fall into its place. Um, so that's something that I've always tried to instill since I got there as a freshman at Merrimack is just making sure that, you know, nothing is, is too big. You have to just make sure that you're doing that part, doing your job right. And then taking it the next step at a time as it goes. So. Christian, let's talk a little bit about your playing career. Uh, you were on those last couple Merrimack championship teams, huge player in those. Um, you were part of the transition over to division one. What sort of experience was that like, first of all, winning the first championship that you were a part of, and then kind of being a part of the transition as well? Oh, it was incredible. I mean, you know, I grew up right down the street from Gillette and, uh, got to play in a national championship with my, with my brother there. Um, you know, so that was pretty special. Um, and then to do it the next year too, it was even crazier, uh, just two completely different stories of years. Um, so each means something like different. Um, and then the transition to division one, you know, was very interesting as well. Um, you know, it was happened during COVID as well. A lot of things were hectic, you know, we couldn't make the tournament. Um, it was just, it was weird. People were leaving fifth years. You didn't really know what to expect. Um, so it's kind of, it was kind of crazy. Uh, but I think that like those situations, like our team grew even tighter because you know, we realized there was a lot of things stacked against us in those um, first couple of years. And I think that's why we were able to have some success. You know, the coaches you know, stuck with us and, you know, did a great job recruiting and bringing guys in uh, even during that dead period. And then, you know, the upperclassmen knew that our job was to make sure that everyone was buttoned up off the field, making sure everything was good so that when we could get chances to play, um, we could in that. And, you know, even though the dead period, um, you know, we weren't allowed to make playoffs and whatnot, our group was so competitive that 
you know, we saw it as an opportunity to, you know, show people what we're made of. And, you know, you always hear those talks growing up, especially of, you know, you know division two, II, division one, D three, like all that stuff. And, uh, you know, I felt like we were like a real life version of being able to like talk about those arguments of people saying like, oh, they're not as good as this or whatnot. Um, and being able to prove that, you know, like you can hang and even win some upper uh, games in those situations. So um, I thought that I was a really cool experience and I'm, and I'm glad I could have a little bit of division two and division one in it. I got a little perspective on both of them. So um, it was a great experience over there. What made you stay? Cause you had the option to leave because of that COVID year. What, what made you stay with the team and then continue to, to coach there after your playing career was done? Yeah. I mean um, it was, it was kind of a no brainer for me because um, you know, coming out of high school, I didn't really have any looks um, and coach Morgan and the Merrimack staff, you know, they, uh, they gave me an opportunity and took a chance on me. So like when I got on that campus, it was pretty given that I was going to give all of whatever I had left in my career back to them. And uh, so when I had that fifth year opportunity, you know, I was like, I'm definitely going back. Um, and, you know, I had a great group of guys around me as well. Some of my best friends, um, some great underclassmen. And I was like, I just want to see it all the way through and, uh, and finish out my career there. Um, and then same thing with coaching there. You know, I love being a part of that program. It was great to me. So if I could give anything back to it, you know, that was my chance to do so. So. Now your dad won a national championship at BAPS. And I think it was in 1984 on the hockey team. Yeah, yeah. And so you had a, um, do better and get two national championships at uh, at Merrimack. Huh? Yeah, so yeah. Some, you got the bragging rights in the house, huh? Used to bring out, used to bring out the ring. Um, show show us it. A little different. Ours are look a little different than theirs did back then. Um, a little more expensive. Yeah, a l- little bit. Yeah, we have. Uh, my mom is is a picture of her wearing all the rings on her hand, and it's such a funny picture. Um, but it is pretty wild because you know, obviously, used to hear those stories growing up. My my dad would say talk about his buddies and we'd see pictures and um so like when we did that it was one of those things it's like well that's pretty cool like now we can say that we all have one so uh, yeah not not many families or people can uh, say that that uh (laughs) you've got three national championships in your house (laughs) definitely definitely crazy to say the least and i know your dad was uh very green to the lacrosse game game when you and, uh, and dom started playing and as he got to learn you know, more about the game. He, like you, he fell in love with it. And obviously he's a big fan Mm -hmm. of the game and your mom is as well. But I know there was some days where like, he's like, you know, because he's a big hockey guy, loves hockey. Now he's become a lacrosse guy. But to see you and Dom fall in love with lacrosse, you know, obviously he was very happy for you guys. He was like, damn, I wish they were still playing hockey. I know. We, uh, we talked about that all the time. We used to joke, especially when we got older, like in high school. um, Because I remember you know, you brought us over to lacrosse in our first like year or so we wore hockey, hockey equipment, like our hockey helmets, shoulder pads, yeah, everything, yeah, gloves. Right. Yeah. And uh, I remember one day, like you showed up in practice and you threw the box down and you're like, they're not wearing hockey stuff anymore. They're wearing this. <laughs> so we got some lacrosse stuff out of it. But as we got older, we talked about it and we were always like, do you like wish that we ended up like trying to pursue hockey? And he was like, no, like as I got older, I used to like love watching you guys play lacrosse. And I started like learning more about the game and realizing like, I think I might love watching you guys play lacrosse more. And I think that's probably like around the same time that me and Dom realized that we probably started liking playing lacrosse a little bit more. You know, I loved hockey. It was always, and still will be like a huge part of my life. Play men's league now out of Foxborough and Walpole. So <laughs> I wants to come check out games. Um, but it's, uh, it was one of those things that we both, I think were kind of like, Oh, like, you know, I would love to play lacrosse in college. I think this is going to be a great opportunity. Um, and I think that he saw that as a great opportunity too. And now I think if you asked him, I mean, he's still following box scores of kids that we know playing and all that stuff. I mean, he loves it. Like he's, he's pumped. He'll be at all the Harvard games this year that he can be like the guy. Now he just can't get away from it. So I think he, uh, I think he adapted pretty quickly too to us loving it. Yeah, he was a heck of a player as well, Dom at Merrimack. What year did Dom graduate? He was uh, COVID year 2020. He did that, yep. So got to play 
two and a half years with him. Got to play with him at New Hampton as well. Um, so that was, I mean, that was awesome to get to play with him for sure. And you won one national championship together and you win two together, correct? We won two together, yeah. He, oh, you... he was in three. Right. Lost in 2017 to Limestone. And then um, and then we both, we won in Gillette and in Philly the next two years. Yeah, it's pretty special not only even having the opportunity to play with your brother, but to win two national championships. Uh, yeah. That's very, very special and um, yeah. a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, hundred percent. There's uh there's some videos out there on, on YouTube and there's one of them, it's my favorite. We're walking off the field and we're just so gassed, like you can tell at halftime. And we were just like, we gotta keep going. It was like ninety something degrees. It was like the hottest game I ever played in my life. And then it was like one of those things, it's like, you know, for him to like me and him to look at each other in that spot and be like, let's we just gotta finish the game. It was like that was pretty special for sure. Yeah, a moment you'll never forget, yeah, obviously. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I, I tell this story a lot. Uh, I was in the press box for the St. Leo game and I was working for Inside the Cross and most people don't know a lot about D2, right? Like it's the national media is not full in on D2 unless they're local, they have local ties. I had watched the Merrimack team play. I'd done a story uh, on Morgan and I'm sitting in the press box and I'm watching the St. Leo team warm up. I'm watching Merrimack warm up. Everyone comes up to me. They're like, you're like the D2, D3 guy, right? I'm like, sure i guess and they're like what's your call for this game i'm like i just turned i remember i turned and looked at a national jersey i go listen i don't have a lot of things in my life i would take my parents house and put it up on merrimack whatever the odds are they're going to destroy them and this person just looked at me like i was crazy and i was like watch go sit down and you guys did exactly that. And that guy, that guy came up to me afterwards. He's like, how'd you know? I was like, sometimes, you know, man, sometimes you watch a team and you're like, they're so, this is the thing about Merrimack. I think people don't understand now that they're kind of D one, they're adjusting a little bit, right. They're still in that kind of period where they're ramping up. They were at the height of the ramp. They were Tony Hawk about to drop in, 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 in D two at that point. And it's because, well, listen, it's because of how you guys practice, man. Like the only other team I can compare it to is like old school UMass. Cause it's straight up. It looked like fist fights. Like, like That's every drill was intense, everything you guys did. And I literally, at one point I looked at Morgan, I'm like, do you want me to leave? This is like, I probably shouldn't see this. Right. And he's like, I don't care. Yeah. And he, he might've thrown an expletive in there. Uh, cause that's also his style. I love it, Yeah, but it's, it's, it, I mean, no one fits into Massachusetts better than Mike Morgan, even though he's not from here. Yep. For sure. I mean, you said it right there. Uh, the culture of it was, uh, was something that I, I loved, you know, from day one, even from when I would just go see my brother after games or whatnot, when I was in high school, um, you know, just from even having like small conversations with some of the upperclassmen that were there. And then when I came in as a freshman, you just felt it right away. Um, those guys brought you in and it was like, this is how it's going to go. And we'll all love each other as long as this is how it's going to go. And so obviously, you know, you have a bunch of guys who just have the same goal, you know, things get heated, practices get a little hot. Um, but I felt it like, you know, like you said, for that St. Leo's game, I could have told you that at the beginning too. Cause I just remember my upperclassmen, like since day one in, in September, we're like, you know, we're going to, we're going to win a national championship and we're going to do everything it takes to get there. And we're not going to leave any doubt. So on that day, when I'd look at them, you know, I was obviously a freshman, a little bit of, a little bit of butterflies going to the game. I remember just looking across at some of the fifth years and seniors. And I was like, well, they, they clearly don't seem nervous. So I'm ready to go. And, uh, you know, obviously the rest is history, but I, I agree with you on that one. I would have thrown the house down too. <laughs> Yeah, it's I, I don't usually say stuff like that. But when I do, people are like, what? No way. <laughs> uh, but it, it was it was a great experience talking to Morgan after the game, too. Like, I've interviewed him a bunch of times. Like, I have a pretty good relationship with him. Uh, he did not recognize me at a tournament this summer, though. Uh, so I'm going to shade him a little bit. <laughs> I, like, waved at him, and he just stared right through me like I was not there. And then I talked to Coach Dianjikis, and he's like, how early was it? And I was like, I don't know. It was, like, second game. He's like, yeah, he didn't have coffee yet. He's not talking to you yet. He doesn't even see you. I'm like, yeah. okay, I feel a little better about it. Because <laughs> uh, he's, you know, it, it's interesting because you are going from a coach of that intensity to another coach with the same intensity in, in GB. 
And I, I think like, that's a great fit for you. I'm sure that he called Morgan and was like, what's this kid like? And he's just like battler, you know? Okay. And that's probably part of how you got that job, which I, I think is great. Um, let's talk a little bit about playing in the lakes region. Uh, kind of my, my house. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I played at Tilton. I'm at P- PG at Tilton. Uh, nice. So I'm sure you smashed us 20 goals to, to one during your time there. Cause I know New Hampton at that time you were playing, there was a real powerhouse in the region. Uh, since then it's kind of become one and two with them in Holderness. Um, what was your experience like, you know, playing at a, at a prep school in New Hampshire? And I'm assuming you were boarding. So how, how, what was that like for you going from, you know, Rentham to, to a place like that? Yeah, it was interesting. So I actually, I, I went to a junior boarding school too, um, called Hillside. So I went there in middle school for hockey actually. Um, and that's kind of, I think, where I found a little bit more of my love for lacrosse as well. But then my brother went to New Hampton while I was still at Hillside. So I got to go up there and, uh, like, visit and see him have experiences. You know, he was um, a three-sport athlete there, soccer, hockey, lacrosse. So I'd go watch all the games and loved it. Um, and then I met Coach Simon, um, who I'm sure everybody knows in this room, um, who was, it was an awesome guy still is like, um, you know, was a coach of mine. Now has become a friend of mine. Um, and I met him and I was like, I want to go play for this guy. And when I got there, um, you know, he's, he'd only been there for a few years now and you could just tell like what he was building at the time. You know, he had got some, some good players over there. Um, he was getting some, some guys to transfer in. Um, and you could tell he just, he wanted us to just, be the best that we could and pushed us to be that and um, end up losing at the championship my freshman year to Brewster Academy. And then since that day, uh, we we had won for, I think, everyone moving forward for the next, I don't know, six or so years, um, but truly did build a powerhouse over there. Like he was such a great recruiter and such a great coach. Um, and he, he got all of us together and it was like, we all wanted to just play for each other and play for him. And I think it was a really special group up there. Um, it was like, at the time, I always felt a very underrated uh, team in, in the country because it was like in the middle of New Hampshire. No one really like knew of us. And it was like one of those weird things where I'm like, I feel like this is just the Lakes region just was not talked about at the time. And I'm glad to see that it's getting mu- much more press right now as deservedly so. You know, there's some great teams up there with some great coaches. You know, I know a lot of those guys now through the club circuit that I've met. They're awesome. They're doing a great job up there. Um, And I got to go watch a few of those games this year. They're very competitive and there's some good lacrosse players up there. So, um, you know, I think I remember reading like an article of your guys at one point saying it was a a hidden gem and I couldn't agree more. I wrote that. I I was going to say, I feel like I definitely read that one and I couldn't agree more. You know, there's some great people up there um, and, and there's some good games. So, I encourage some people to watch some if they get the opportunity because, you know, I know it's in the middle of nowhere at times, but some good stuff. Are you serious about playing your sport in college? Do you need a flexible education that allows you to maintain your practice and competition schedules while also preparing you to succeed at the next level? You should check out the University of Nebraska High School. UNHS is accredited and offers more than 100 online courses, including NCAA-approved courses to protect your academic eligibility. Students could earn a UNHS diploma or take a single course for transfer credit. Courses are college prep, self-paced, and available 24-7, 365. Enroll anytime and take up to a year to complete a course. Visit highschool.nebraska.edu today. Escape the everyday hustle and bustle and retreat to the Mountain Inn in Killington. Nestled in the heart of the breathtaking Green Mountains in Vermont, our cozy rooms and luxurious amenities offer the perfect getaway for relaxation and rejuvenation. Hike, golf, and bike your way through stunning mountains. Enjoy our handcrafted small batch spirits inspired from the blissful Killington region and distilled on site at Killington Distillery. And pair your cocktail with our delectable food offerings made from sustainably sourced ingredients right from around Killington. Book your stay at the Mountain Inn today and experience the ultimate mountain escape. Just go to mtinn.com today to make your reservation. That's mtinn.com. 
We look forward to seeing you. Uh, Jack and I were actually going to call a game, uh, but our schedules didn't allow for it during the, during the season, a, uh, a, a lakes region game. We got invited and I was like, cause I did it last year. Yeah. The previous season before and I did it by myself and I had no idea how hard that would be. Um, I feel like I did terrible, but everyone was like, no, it was great. You did great. And I'm like, no, I did bad. Uh, <laughs> sometimes you got to step back and just be like, didn't do great there. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those places where, you know, New Hampshire in general, not as respected as, as it has been, you know? And, and I think that the coming classes coming through four leaf and, and Tomahawks and these prep schools, and even, you know, listen, you know, Bishop garden, all, all these great teams, uh, in the southern part of the state, as well as the northern part, are are going to get high level guys. I mean, you know, you talk about Simon. Simon moved from New Hampton to Holderness, and then just built Holderness into into a power. And they have an incredible. They just graduated an incredible class, and they got another incredible class coming up for twenty four and twenty five. So, it's it's definitely a place to to pay attention to. Um, and you actually worked with Coach Simon at Furley for a little bit, right? Yep. Yeah. I've been with, uh, I've been with them since I think 2017. Um, and I think that's, that might've been around when Simon came in, but, um, I've coached a bunch of different teams there, but I'm with the 2020, 2026 team. Now I've had them for a few years. Um, I love doing that type of stuff with the, with the younger kids. Um, I think it's really important with, with them to develop like good habits too early on, learn how to play the game the right way. Um, you know, at the end of the day, obviously you want to win, but you can't win if you don't know how to do all those things. So teaching them now to not get as frustrated with the results of that and just being like, this is how we're going to play. Let's do it this way. And then encouraging them to do all that. Um, I'm glad that I've been with that group for a few years because I'm starting to see them start to like love it, I think, um, which is cool as a coach to see. Cause you're like, you know, they were just young kids when I got them. And now they're, they're like one year away from getting recruited, which is pretty wild to see too. So. It's fun. And some of them are coaching at Harvard now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this guy, don't leave me hanging. Where I'm there right <laughs> uh, yeah, this guy right here. Great example of why I love that type of stuff. I mean, we just played in Lake Placid this, this past week, and it was the same group of guys that we grew up with our whole lives. And, uh, you know, it's just special to, to be a part of that. And you see, how much you love the game because you've been playing it even when we're older and haven't played some of us in years or months and we get out there and it's just like you just see the joy and you know how passionate people play and that's because it was instilled when we were younger and that's why it's so fun you know friends for life and and certainly friends for life uh special magic magic yeah. time absolutely yeah I, I think it's one of those things where you know, I've experienced this, you know, in the past couple of years coaching at Hopkinson where parents don't always see the bigger picture when they sit, they want their kid to play all that stuff. And they don't see like the team bonding. They don't come to practices. They don't see any of that. And then it, it's funny what winning does, right? Like winning kind of opens their eyes to, well, my son's not playing, but they're winning and he seems happy. Right. And then eventually like the, I had a conversation last year with a parent where I was just like, everyone gets their turn if they put the work in, if they don't put the work in, they don't get their turn. Like that's how this works. You know, like that's, and by the way, that's how life works. That's mm -hmm. why I think sports are great for, for younger players to get into. And then, you know, if they want to go to the next level, they have to put in the work. You can't just walk into a team and expect to be the leading scorer. Cause you were the leading scorer when you were eight. That's not how, how it works. Like you have to put in the off season work, you know, the, the conditioning and things like that. And I think that's like a, like a great lesson for younger players to take away for sure. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, like coach Morgan used to say to me, you know, when I was a player um, and, and I think this goes with kind of what you were just saying right there and winning as well, you know, when things are going good, that's when you need to be the most on guard because, you know, if you think that you just won a game, you're going to win the next one, you're going to lose the next one. So you need to always, you know, if you want to be a winner, you need to be, able to just after the next game, just keep going and just be like, you know, it's a completely different one. Got to reset, got to do what we have to do. Same thing after a loss. Um, you know, so I think sometimes, especially with like young kids, they get so high with like the emotions of like they lose and it's like the end of the world or they win. And it's like, we're going to win every time. It's like, nope, 
it's a completely different game every time. You just got to show up, be ready to go. See what happens. And in high school, winning isn't as important maybe as it is in college, right? It's really, but especially at the club level, you know, as long as you're competing at a high level or the, the level you're able to compete at and you're developing, and then you like you said, you're building relationships too, which is everything. Yeah. I mean, you built a relationship with Coach Morgan as a player, as a coach, and now you have an opportunity to coach it. Harvard. Mm -hmm. It's all about relationships. Yep. And you know, and you've developed some great relationships in a short period of time. Totally. Let me ask you a question. How tall are you? I'm like five ten. Five ten. What did you weigh when you played at Merrimack? Um, when I graduated, I was about 150, 155. But when I played in the second national championship, I weighed 138. 138. Yep. And you were the MVP of that game. Not that one. That one. The, the next one. Which I was probably lighter. In that oh, one. okay. So <laughs> yeah. the third, uh, the third championship game for Merrimack, you were the MVP of that game, correct? The one at Gillette. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, round one thirty-eight, five ten. Yeah. All American MVP of the game. So anybody can play this game, whether you're big, small. What was what gave you the ability to play at a high level? Only even though you're only 138 and 510. Yeah, um, it was, I mean, you know, obviously it wasn't easy at times, I'm sure. There's a lot of people going out there in the same situation. But um, one thing that I, now looking back on my career as I've gotten older, kind of realized was making sure that, you know, I wasn't going to be the biggest, fastest guy to run by anyone. You know, it wasn't something that I was just going to be able to do. It was just a fact, especially early on. Um, so I tried to have like the best stick skills that I could. I tried to learn the game as best I could. And I tried to use what I thought I had as my advantage, which was being quick and uh, shifty and uh, witty off ball and that type of thing. And I tried to learn that role as best as I could because my dad used to tell me since I was really young, it'll all catch up. You know, everyone's going to grow at some point, you know, but it's different for everybody. Um, you know, and I didn't even still grow fully till college. I was still putting on weight. Um, but I just wanted to develop what I felt I could get my leg up on guys. And then when I was able to be somewhat as big as everybody else, that that stuff would all catch up to me. And then I'd still have my hands and my IQ and my savviness of things that I had to learn at a young age, because if I didn't, then I wouldn't have been able to be out there, um, with those guys. So I think, you know, I tell the kids now, it doesn't matter. You know, you could be six, five, two fifteen. You could be five, eight, you know, one thirty five, whatever. Um, you got to play to what you have as your strength and then try and learn more after that. And that's kind of what I had to do. You, know? you got to be gritty and you got to be tough and no one more gritty and uh, tougher than you. I'll tell you yeah, that. This guy used you to know? say, you catch a ball in front of the net. You got to you turn, you can't you count to three, catch it one, turn two, shoot three, and you're going to get hit. But it feels a lot better when it goes in. Absolutely, <laughs> definitely <I> not. <laughs> but but you put a lot of them in. Yeah, you got. So uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, not a tougher attack in in this country back in the day when uh, Christian uh, was playing. I, I got to see him play uh, up at Lake Placid too. He had a, a couple of beautiful goals. One game he had four goals. I think they were four in a row. But uh, the thing that I like what you said is you learned what your strengths were really, yeah. and you strengthen your strengths. And you knew, you knew what your weaknesses were. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important message for a lot of our players and listeners. You know, know what your strengths are. Um, you can make your weaknesses stronger, but make your strengths great, right? Yep. Make, make them better than who you're competing against. And that's exactly what you did. I mean, what you really uh, became uh, a great shooter as well. And we learned how to get the ball out of your stick really quickly so the goaltender doesn't have time to see the ball coming out of the stick. You know, a lot of kids, you see it all the time, want to wind up and shoot. You don't wind up and shoot. You catch and you get it off and you're strong enough where you get enough speed, 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, maybe, but it's maybe more. Yep. I don't know, but yep. it's out and in the goal before the goalie can react. Yep, totally. I mean, you know, I remember, yeah, I was learning obviously a lot of that stuff growing up as well, but when I got a little bit older and I started realizing that, 
my role on the team was a little bit more off ball, not as much distributor. Um, you know, my coaches used to tell me that I needed to maximize my opportunities with that. So I needed to score at a high percentage if I was going to help the team with that. So a lot of hours of, I, you know, I'd go play wall ball, obviously get my hands going, but just working on my shot and working on the accuracy. Cause again, I was going to get limited opportunities in games because of my size. So when I got it on the crease or I caught it for a step down, you know, I needed to at least score at a higher rate than if I was just shooting like two for 10. So that was a huge focus of mine, um, kind of through high school into college a little bit more. Um, but kind of going off that funny story, my brother, it was like my first year starting at New Hampton and he was the opposite of me. He was a distributor, dodger, you know, he could do all that stuff. Fast. Yeah, he was he was a little bit bigger than me. He wasn't that big still, but a little bit bigger than me. I'll give him that. And uh, I remember my first game starting he fed me on the crease and I dropped the ball and uh, he came up to me um, after and he goes, if you, I'm not going to throw it, if you don't catch it, so you better start catching the ball in there. And so I remember after that game, I went and I would just throw like go play wall ball. It's like, I got, I got to get my hands going cause he's not going to pass it anymore. <laughs> and uh, it's true. I mean, little things like that. I was like, all right, like that's my role. So I got to get really good at my role. And if, if you want to find time on a field, you got to know your role and your role changes. You know, mine changed a little bit, but for the most part, I knew my role. Um, but yeah, it was funny. That's so important to players not knowing their role on the yeah. team. And you talk about winning two national championships. Obviously, everybody knew what their role was. And the guys on the bench were part of that team and knew exactly they're not going to get any time, but that's okay. We're here to make the team better. You know, we want to win this national championship, but not every team has that explained. Yeah, so important. I mean, the guys who show up every day at practice, battle through injury, um, get yelled at, whatever it is, and don't get time on game day is, to me, uh, some of the best teammates you could have out there because they're just selflessly – and putting their bodies on the line and their time on the line, all that stuff uh, for the betterment of the team. And if you don't have guys like that on your team, it's pretty hard to have a winning culture. I think you need to know, um, you know, and, uh, and obviously at the end of the day, everyone wants to get on the field and play, you know, everyone's competitive. Um, and you never know when your opportunity is going to come. You, some of those, some of those kids opportunity could come like that. You know, there's injuries, things happen, whatever, but to be able to just know that you need to show up, give everything and whatever happens at the end of that, at the end of the day, you're on a team and you support each other and you do your role. Um, it's, it's such an under, or yeah, underlooked part of a, of a good team, I think is, is those types of players. You know, some of those guys that I played with, you know, I respect them so highly of everything they did for the team and um, you know, the, the selflessness that they put in on their time and they're still on the sideline, just getting rowdy during a game. You know, um, it's it's really impressive, impressive to me to see guys like that, for sure. Yeah, it's a very difficult role to play, especially yeah. if you're accustomed to playing. You're coming in from high school, you're mm -hmm. the starter for four years, you haven't left the field, and then yep. you come to college, and now you're on the bench, and, you know, you got to find a, a way to make it work and just keep working hard, yep. not not uh, get frustrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's yeah, definitely. It's a very, uh, it's one of those things that, you know, I always wanted to make sure that they understood, especially when I was more of an upperclassman, like how much it was appreciated of like the team, especially at the end of the year, some of those seniors, you know, it's just, uh, it's a testament to their, their character and, you know, their teammate ability. So. I think if you go and watch a Merrimack game, I'm not, I'm not saying they invented the sideline craziness, but um, it definitely developed there. Uh, it is even the backup, backup, backup goalie is celebrating for everything. Like it's, it's one of those places where like, and Merrimack's funny because they can't, they redid the field and the campus is a little different now from when I used to go back when it was more D2, they have a much bigger field. It's, it's uh like much better presentation for fans. And you can see, usually they line up on the side behind the bench. So you can like look down. And it's not even that high up. You can see and hear pretty much everything. Uh, if if you go to a Merrimack game, it's it's a lot of fun. Like if you're if you're local to 
to Massachusetts and you're looking for a game when the college season starts, like a Merrimack game is a fun game to go to because you're going to see an animated sideline. You're going to see big hits in the game. You're going to see some crazy goals. That's just what that team does. You know, that hard work element is the heart and core of that squad. Do you remember a any someone you're talking about all these players that maybe didn't play that much, but really helped inspire you and, and make you want to go out and, you know, battle for them. Do you remember a specific guy that did that for you? Um, yeah, I remember, uh, he was a great below me. Um, Rob Hermanson, um, he, he was from New Jersey, uh, played at CBA and, um, you know, he came in, he battled through a lot of injuries. Um, you know, obviously had some, some tough days some good days, but, you know, he showed up all the time and was just such a, an uber uh, competitor and teammate of a guy who, you know, game day comes and he's the first one being like, hey, go get him today. Like, you know, and then you score or whatever. And he's the first guy celebrating to like get on the field, um, stuff like that. Uh, I, I just he was a guy that, you know, when I was in practice and I'd see him going hard, I'm like, well, I have to go hard right now. You know, there's no other option if this kid's going hard and sacrificing that, then I'm going to do the same thing, uh, if not more, so that he knows that, like, we're in it together. So, um, yeah, I think the, the sideline thing, that, I mean, it's a testament, obviously, to Coach Morgan and the culture that he put in there, but it, it was one of those things that we used to say, like, we're going to celebrate a, a timeout just as hard as we're going to celebrate a goal, or we're going to ro- celebrate a ride back or a save or a clear or whatever it is, just as hard as a goal, and whether we're losing or winning, you know not being a front runner and, and just being, you know, in the game at all times, no matter what you're doing on the field or off the field, um, which is, it is pretty good. It's, it's infectious on the field. I'll tell you, I felt it a few times. You just hear the bench and you're like, all right, let's go. Yeah. hundred percent stole that for my team. <laughs> like when we, we saw, I, I had this like talk beginning of the season and we had kids that just were like, kind of lackadaisical we're we're kind of end of tryouts we know who's on varsity who's on jv and we're in like a scrimmage and like kids are just like scoring like putting their head down i was like what are you doing hey and i just stopped the play brought everyone in i'm like we celebrate every goal every single goal i don't care if it's practice we're going to celebrate the goal it doesn't have to be crazy but we're going to do it together i might have sent the wrong message because we played a jv game the next day and i had a kid who's a first year player he scored and he sprinted to the, 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 uh, oh my God, my brain just stopped working. He, he's, he sprinted to the, the sideline and grabbed the scorebook and wrote down his name and put the thing in. And I was like, whoa, that's not what I meant. We're not doing this. This is unsportsmanlike. This is not what we're doing. But he was just so excited. And he, you know, he never played before and he scored a goal. He lost his mind. Uh, so I think, you know, that, it's it's great. It's one of the great things about lacrosse is like you always remember your first goal, right? Like you you remember it, and and it goes from level to level to level to level. And everyone's like, "Oh, what's your best goal?" I don't think a lot of people know what their best goal is, but I guarantee you, everyone knows what their first goal is. So, what's your what was your first goal, and what did you do to celebrate? Um, my first goal was at. Uh... NYIT, my freshman year's first game of the year, and uh, my boy Sean Black um, fed me on an off-ball cut, and I just kind of quick released it. I don't even know where it went in. I think it went low, and I just turned and started selling to the crowd. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh boy, I might have just yeah, I just might have signed my own my own death wish right there with some of these guys, <laughs> the young the young freshmen <laughs> celebrating crazy. Yeah, there were some big boys in other team. I was like. I was like, well, it's too late now. <laughs> Who's yeah, bigger, what? you or Sean Black? I know uh, the answer. I just want I just want to hear you say it. I'm taller. Uh Sean's probably a little stockier. Um, but I'll tell you what, I wouldn't wrestle Sean Black because uh him and his dad, they uh they know what they're doing. Mr. Black over at Wesleyan wrestling coach and strength and conditioning guy. So um I think I'd lose that that battle right there. But nice. <laughs> So you're the new director of operations yes. at Harvard. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't know what the director of operations responsibilities are. What are you going to be doing for Coach Byrne at Harvard as the director of operations? 
Yeah, I think uh, I'm, a lot of the things I'm learning still some as, as I go right now, but um, I'll be dealing with a lot of the travel, um, you know, hotels, um, planes, buses, food, all that stuff. And then, you know, relationships with the alumni, setting up some of these events that we have put on alumni games um, and, and dinners and meetups. Um, and then kind of some of the day-to-day -day operations, you know, making sure that all the equipment that we have for the fellas, um, you know, sticks, shafts, stringing, all that stuff is there um, for them. Um, and like apparel, purchase ordering. Um, so kind of a lot of like the behind the scenes stuff. Um, it varies daily and weekly. And then there's some long-term stuff, obviously, when we get into season, all that. Uh, but just kind of making sure that everything is organized and set up um, beforehand so that, you know, the team and the coaching staff can go out and not worry about all that stuff and just focus on, you know, game plan and, and practices and games and all that. Stuff. Will you be breaking down any film or anything like that? Um, I don't believe so. Um, I'm still learning obviously some of those parts of it. Um, but I think for the most part, just, um, making sure all that, uh, the other stuff is buttoned up and, and ready for, uh, for us when we travel and for the big events and day-to-day um, -day stuff as well. So. so we're hitting you for gear. Yeah. Yeah. For merch. Yeah. I'm getting okay. some right now. I got some, they, they hooked me up a little bit. Um, nice. Can't, can't beat You're looking merch. really sharp in that Harvard gear. I Thank tell you. you really sharp. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Jack won't wear it cause he's a Cornell guy, but I'll wear it. Yeah. He'll send it I, to me. It's fine. I, I, uh, it was funny, obviously, you know, my best friend back home, Johnny Piatelli. Um, you know, his brother, Cornell guys. So, so had some fun arguments so far with them this year. Uh, but no, it'll be exciting to see the young Brian Piatelli over there for sure. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the things that's super interesting about when you talk about college coaches and college assistants and things, the director of ops role and Jack props to you for stealing my question. That was literally my final question and you did it. I'm very thank, proud of you. Thank you very much. That's pretty awesome. Going. Thank pretty you. Pretty awesome. Can't believe you gave me a compliment. <laughs> hey, uh, you know, I'm not on the drugs yet for the knee, but you know, I'm, I'm getting ready. Uh, so, you know, I, I think being that director of ops, you're doing a ton of admin work. It's actually just as hard as being a coach, if not more hard, uh, like just on the sideline. And I'm sure you'll be doing some sideline stuff as well, but the director of ops role has become in division one, one of these like really big positions. Like it's, it's very important to the success of the team. And uh, I, th I think it's great there. You know, a lot of teams do have other coaches kind of do that, but for Harvard to have this, I know the, the previous guy at Harvard as well uh, loved it uh, and loved doing that kind of work. Are you, are you stringing for them too? No, uh, weirdly enough, I never learned how to string. I always felt like that was very funny that I've played lacrosse for so long. Oh, and I don't know how to string a lacrosse stick. So usually I would just give it to um, when I was in um, college, some of my buddies, John used to string some of mine. And then Coach Burke, um, when he came to Merrimack, used to string some sticks. And I always liked how he strung them. So I might have to bring some back to him when I get them now because <laughs> I don't know how to do it. <laughs> so hopefully the boys over at, at Harvard know how to string some sticks and, you know, go from there. Who is the craziest most influential coach that you ever played for oh my god craziest well it's a coin flip but i'd probably have to say keith campbell <laughs> <laughs> i know he'll be watching this right now i used to uh i used to get yelled at at, at a practice and i'd get sunflower seeds all over me uh <laughs> but it was uh it was it was one of those things where he just was so passionate about it that it just, it was infectious and it, and it passed off. He's a close second though. So don't let anyone tell you otherwise. <laughs> the amount of hat throws this guy used to have, you'd have to duck when you're on the sideline. You never know what's coming at you. Thank God I didn't give him a clipboard. Yeah. That's true. I've calmed down a little bit since those days. Yeah. <laughs> Coach Campbell, I can confirm has not. Uh, <laughs> I, I wrote a uh, one of these uh, pre playoff previews for his uh, high school team division and I included them in it as like a, a team that could win. And he, he just sends me a text. He's like, 
And Jack, you're on it too. He's like, hey, thanks for saying we aren't going to win. It's going to really motivate us. I was like, no, I, and then I just didn't argue. I was like, <laughs> Hard okay, argue. we'll let that go. That's, yeah. uh, that's the Keith oh, Campbell yeah. way. But great guy. I, I saw him at the show. I scored a goal once in the summer tournament. It went in. And I came off the field and he was like, you're lucky that went in. And I'm like, it went in. <laughs> that was him. Yeah. I was a junior in high school. It was, I remember it very clearly. It yeah. was so funny. Uh, Too much. I know. All right, Christian, we gotta, we gotta bring this to a close. Uh, thanks again for coming on. Really appreciate you uh, joining the podcast. Uh, good luck in Cambridge. It's, uh, it's a wild place. It's a lot of fun to, to see games there. And I'm sure you'll be a huge part of uh, the staff. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me on. Super excited to be over there and uh, come check out some, some Harvard games this upcoming spring. Thanks again for listening to New England Lacrosse Journal's Chasing the Gold podcast. Jack Piatelli, I'm Kyle Devitt. We'll see you next time.